the Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Our guests waiting to be profiled are Harry Karp and James P. White. Playwright Harry Karp was born in Brooklyn and attended Hebrew school. He went there till the eighth grade, and then he transferred to a yeshiva in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, then to another yeshiva in Troy, New York, where he started creative writing. After that, he went to a seminary in Israel to study uh, Hasidic philosophy. Hasidic philosophy. And I'm a little bit confused about why we call these schools different names. So start with Hebrew school. I guess the Hebrew school is where kids go. Uh, you know, grammar school age, and then as you uh, get into high school. Is it for boys and girls, or is it just a boys' school? There are. There are boys and girls' school. The ones I went to were segregated or separated. They were. Uh, the boys and the girls studied separately. And the girls didn't re really refer to their schools as a yeshiva. It was really more school. Oh, so then we get to the yeshiva. Hebrew school is one thing. Is that all together? The kids are all together, not separated? No, no, they, they are separated. They could be there, They, they too. could be. So you have some yeshivas that are mixed and some that aren't. I see. The one that I went to was a little bit more... Uh, Orthodox. So. I see. So then, so yeshiva is just another school? Is that what we're, where yeah, we're going? You, I think you're really getting different names for uh, different ages of a kid's life. Oh, I see. Because I always hear, you know, Hebrew school, then yeshiva. I didn't know about seminary. Is seminary for the rabbinical training? It can either be for rabbinical training or just some advanced studies. Uh, where I come from, a lot of kids went through... Uh, more advanced studies, just par for the course. And uh, even if they had no plans to actually become a rabbi. They would go to the seminary? Yeah, they'd go to, they'd go to seminary and study a little bit more, where you spend all your time uh, studying just a particular subject, just a Hebrew subject, just the Talmud or philosophy or whatever it is that you're interested in. And are there seminaries all throughout the United States, all throughout the world? Yeah, yeah, I went I to I just uh, didn't know about the seminaries. I knew yeah, about there are seminaries all throughout, in many states, uh, in, in several continents, uh, United States, uh, in Israel, South Africa, Australia, Europe, and uh, I happened to go to a number of them. And you, <laughs> did you? <laughs> you sounded like a professional student, and yet you're so young. <laughs> One of the well, that was all before I was 19. Is that what happened? Yeah. That then was I, all before? All before I was 19. Then I came out here to act. Oh, I can't believe it. Before you came out here, you traveled in Russia, Spain, New York, and as you say, you've settled in Los Angeles. What were you doing in Russia? Seminary? No, no seminary. <laughs> that was, we had a summer camp. We ran a summer camp for Jewish kids uh, shortly after the Soviet Union fell. Ah. And they were uh, open to that idea. And where did you come from to go to that summer camp or to teach it? I was from New York. You went well, right I was from just, New York? I was a camp counselor. I didn't really do much teaching. Uh -huh. uh, we just we taught, the ki we, ta we taught the kids baseball as much as we taught them anything else. But they were Jews living in Russia? Mostly. Mostly Jewish kids. It was all kinds of kids attended the camp, but they were Russian kids. Oh, they did. <laughs> who uh, had, were either Jewish or had an interest in going to a, to a camp. It served good food. <laughs> was it good? No. Uh, well, the food there? Yeah. Well, we did as best we could. Um, <laughs> see there, the, you know, fish and grain, and there wasn't much else. But early in the early days of the fall, I think things were a little bit different. Yeah. Then you were in Spain. Well, I was actually in Spain before that. Oh, you were in Spain before. I that. was working. At, we were making wine. I went there. I was working for a wine merchant, uh, and. Uh, that was that was good. I actually worked in Cali. I had I got my experience working on a at a, at a winery in Spain. Was it blessed wine? Was it uh, f f kosher or? wine? Yeah, was it kosher, kosher wine? We wouldn't call it blessed wine. It was just making kosher wine. <laughs> was and not so blessed. I, <laughs> well, some people did the missed. rabbi bless it. Well, the rabbi we supervised it. The, the rabbi super supervised it. He doesn't have to bless it. I see. I see. So we went out there and we we made wine. Is that right? And so you just use any grapes. Mm -hmm. But then the rabbi. Well, all we did was we had to clean the plant. 
out. Oh, we, that's interesting. We washed out all the pipes and all the hoses and all the barrels and all the containers that we were going to use. And then we had our own uh, days where we produced our wine that was going to be our kosher wine. Is that right? And we sealed it up and let it ferment. Oh, that's interesting. So you use the same facilities as other wine people. Yeah, absolutely. But you had a certain, um, what, rigmarole that you had to go through or a certain... Uh, we had to flush out all the uh, pipes and all the connections and all the... Uh, I don't they know, were probably people. happy. They yeah, they got, they got they, exactly. They got, and we got and we had to pay them more for the day. <laughs> and then, uh, wh when you were in New York, what were you doing? Well, that's where I lived. Oh, and what and were you I, doing? And I, I wasn't doing much, and that's why I was always finding other places to go to, to study. For some for some reason, my uh, my calling was never has never been in New York. Oh. New York was always I went to visit family, and I hung around, and I had nothing to do, and. Uh, other cities were the key for me, which is why I came out here so young. And well, you came out here and you got uh, a part parts in L.A. law and uh, civil, civil wars. Civil wars, yeah, and two wonderful. A lot of commercials. Mm -hmm. Did you go to acting classes? Well, I kind of chanced onto these uh, programs, and uh, and after and after I got them and they liked me and they called me back. I said, well, maybe that's a good thing to look into. You didn't have an agent? I had no agent. I had nothing. Uh, I didn't know the first thing about the business. When I, deci I decided to get an agent after that. But how does someone do that? Because it's great for our audience to know that you don't always have to have an agent. You don't have to go through the, you know, the, the one, two, threes. Y you have to have a look or you have to have some quality that the producer wants and they happen to find you and say, would you, you know, be interested in reading for they our show? They found you, they found yeah. you. Yeah, I went down there to be an extra. I found that they were looking for extras. Mm -hmm. And so I went down on, on an extra call and then they asked me if I'd like to read. And I, I read for the part and they, sure enough, they gave it to me. You know, that that happens once in a while, but it does happen. It does. You did, you got commercials because I have a picture here of, of one of the commercials you were in. Yeah, that was my, uh, I did a voting commercial for the federal government to get people out to go out and vote. Uh -huh. Played a character, Clarence. That was a lot of fun. We actually, we I don't know how many by how many percentage points the vote went up, but we got people to come out and vote. But so, did you go with like a cattle call to get this commercial? No, it wasn't a cattle call. That was uh, by this. This was by this time I already had an agent, and uh, I went through the rounds of. Uh, Oh, you already had an agent. Yeah. So here's, oh, yeah. Here's I, I had an agent since '93. <coughs> oh, that's my Carl's Jr. commercial, and Hardee's and other parts well, of the country. Well, we've all seen this one. Uh, everyone knows that one. <laughs> and, uh, because it ran so many times, what happens? It just keeps running. Well, hopefully they'll bring it back for another year. The, the uh, cycle's kind of coming to an end. They're, they're moved on to a new hamburger, but maybe they'll bring it back. <laughs> <laughs> you had uh, a pro your professional writing career then kind of went hand in hand while you were doing commercials, while you're acting, you're still writing. Yeah, well I joined a theater group, uh, uh -huh. the Working Stage Theater in uh, West Hollywood uh -huh. back in 94. Uh -huh. And we, and that company was about creating new drama. Oh, is that what happened? But before, when you were there, weren't you doing Yiddish translations as well? Were you yeah. translating? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I got my first oh, script yeah? that I ever wrote. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> The Remember that? <laughs> the first script that I ever wrote uh, was a Yiddish translation. Because of my uh, years in the yeshiva, I speak Yiddish and I understand, or I can read Hebrew. And uh, somebody had an old Yiddish play that their father had written, and they asked me if I, would, if I could read it, and if I could, would I translate it? And I said, sure. And uh, I got paid for it, and that was, that was a good experience. Did that get you started kind of in writing, or had you already? Well, that was the first, yes, it did, because that's the first time that I worked on a play. And I had to. I worked really hard at it, and I un, I learned something from it. I, I, it's very hard to say what I learned, put it in words, but I learned about playwriting from translating that play, because I don't speak Yiddish. It's not my everyday language, so I really had to study it, and uh -huh. it was line by line with the dictionary. Sometimes it was a revelation, and I really. I got that play. I but, got it. But was the form correct? So you were learning because of the form that the play was in? I think all good plays have to find their own form. Uh. Um, that form it was definitely, it was an old play, probably written in the 20s or the 30s uh -huh. or the 40s. And uh, it was a very vaudevillian form. 
Ah. With a prologue and an epilogue and three acts, and I don't think people would sit through that. But being in the, uh, in the, in the group at the working stage, uh, watching other young playwrights and struggling playwrights working on their, on their scripts, and I was like, I think I can do that. So you did, so you wrote a play for mm -hmm. them, mm -hmm. for the working group. It's called The Emissary. The working stage. The working stage, I'm sorry. It's called The Emissary. Yeah. Now, but this is after how many other plays had you written? I've written, I'd say, five plays. Okay, so plays. this is like at the end now, we're talking about The Emissary. Current. Yes, current. We're current. putting it up. We're working on it. We're in rehearsals. I actually came here to talk to you and I'm not sitting in on the rehearsals. Well, tell me about it. How, how involved are you? Do you pick the director? Yeah, well, I, I approached the director and I was very pleased that he said yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, as a writer, do you have that uh, ability to, to choose the director? Yes and no. Playwriting is very tough, particularly in a small theater. Mm -hmm. And to, on a, to have somebody with a theater who's going to let you and then help you and, and enable you to put up a play, it's a privilege. It's, it's hard see. to get. And well, tell us the story. Tell us a little bit about it. It sounds, to me, it sounded like uh, your life story. It is and it isn't. And it's not my life. And actually, my life, I have to keep that out of the way, that I shouldn't confuse the script. Because rarely is one person's life dramatic enough ah, for a play. Really? Yeah. And so even if you start yourself as a launching pad, you suddenly have to start adding things and changing things and switching things around and adding characters and and uh, mm. and adding ca attributes to your character which aren't yourself mm. and that and, it's, and it actually gets in your way because I, well I wouldn't do that yeah but they, you have to be reminded you're not the character oh, anymore. Oh I see. So what's the story? Give us a little storyline. The story is about a, a Hasidic Jewish man who lives in New York and his mother and his Rebbe, the leader of his community, pass away on the same day. And uh, that's a very big blow to him. And he moves out west to kind of find himself. And he gets a job in catering, and he's working at a catering hall. And he meets various other people working at this catering hall. Uh, and they start to affect his life. And uh, he, goes on a, he, goes on a, he goes on a journey, he goes on a spiritual journey. Even though he's had this before. I mean, he's been close to his rabbi, obviously, mm -hmm. because he's so affected by it. But this takes him in a different way. It takes him in a different way. And he, uh, he begins to explore the world. He sees things that he never saw before. He feels things he never felt before. And Does he give up his religion? <laughs> oh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> the emissary. You have to see the emissary. <laughs> well, ultimately, nobody can ever really give up their religion. I don't think they can. And it, there's always a journey that's going to take you back to, if it's not the same place, probably, hopefully not the same place, but someplace deeper, someplace richer, someplace your own. So the emissary is playing in a small theater in Los Angeles. Right. Could be playing in a small off-Broadway theater. It could be playing anywhere, right? Yeah. Oh, that's the hope. Yeah, we'd love to take it around the country. Well, we're so happy you were with us today. I, I love it. I wanted to talk about your movie, Papaya. Yeah. Was that a good one? That's wonderful. That was that's, <laughs> that's still in the screenplay stage, but that's about a kid growing up in Brooklyn. That's a Brooklyn Same story. Same thing. And you know, um, your uh, producer, Annette Keller, yeah. is like really behind this emissary. So uh, we'll look for Harry Carp and we'll look, <laughs> look for all your life experiences. Super. Great. Thanks. Don't go away because we'll be right back with James White. <laughs> Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and we're back with James P. White, who was born and raised in Texas. He went to Brown University, and because of his body of work, has been awarded a Guggenheim and a Fulbright Fellowship. Uh, Jim wears many hats. I'm going to talk about them all later. But as a novelist, he's written Birdsong, which I have on the set, California Exit, Clara's Call, uh, and Persian Oven. Oven, which I thought was such a great name. Did your uh, fellowships come because of the novels? Yeah, and that was, I think, 10 years ago I had the Guggenheim. I have a fellowship this year from the Alabama 
State Council in the Arts. They give one to a fiction writer and one to a poet, and I got it this year, so that's nice. Oh, well, I've been in Alabama 20 years, so now I guess they think of me as a Southern writer. Congratulations, 20 yeah. years? Yeah. When did you start the SC Master's program? That was, I think, in, uh, my first novel came out in 77, a novel right after that called The Ninth Car in 78. Uh -huh. And I came out here, and the old MFA had been dropped, and I organized a new uh, Master's of Professional Writing. And I love Southern Cal. It's really a nice school. What, what did you actually have to do when you start a program? Did you start it from the Well, very the old beginning? program had been dropped with a lot of hard feelings among different departments, and it was fairly unprofitable for the university. So I had to put together an pro interdisciplinary program and make it profitable for the university and at the same time academically and artistically. But so what, what do you do? You go to the, the say, you don't go to the law school, you go no. to the, the architecture school maybe? No, uh, when I, here's the way that I got the job, I had 13 interviews with different deans and chairmen. In the, within the university? Within the university, within the College of Arts and Sciences. So I basically just had to work oh, with so a lot of departments. you go to English, the English department English, probably. drama, <laughs> inner arts, right. uh, art, uh, uh, film. How do they and want the to interact well. then? How do they interact? Well, we used courses from all the different departments to be a part of our program. Oh, I see. So you and had to choose the yeah. courses from the different schools? Yeah, and it makes a, it makes a degree oh. program uh, really special because we can take some of the best courses from all the different different departments. But it's working with masters, they've uh -huh. already graduated. It's all graduate work, yeah. It was all masters work. Mm -hmm. They were all, were they accomplished? We had 150 graduate students. Yeah, and our students, <coughs> some of them have done really well. One of them, uh, Mark Andrus, wrote As Good As It Gets, uh -huh. and a number of them have done really well. So it's a wonderful program. I, is it still going? Oh, sure. It's still going. Uh, you uh, teach progress, um, creative writing at the University of South Alabama. That's right. South I, Alabama. You want to say yeah. Southern Alabama for some reason. Yeah. South Alabama. And is that the same kind of thing that you yeah, would have done for your master's? Well, I graduated with my master's in creative writing, fiction writing, from Brown University in 1973. And I have only taught fiction writing since then. Um, so all I've taught is a graduate and undergraduate course for 20 how many years. So I'm constantly dealing with writers. Writers, people who are interested in becoming writers, and then professionally with other teachers who are writers, with novelists. So my whole background for almost 30 years has been dealing basically with, with writers, novelists and poets. But how do you find, um, say, working with advanced students mm -hmm. as to new students who are just coming into you probably at the university now? Yeah. Uh, the creative writing courses tend to be like on the upper level anyway. Uh, oh, you think so? Well, Even well, if they come to school now as freshmen, do they take your writing? No, they, they have to be like a junior or senior. Oh, I see. But, but I went to Dallas one time. <laughs> I had tenure at a u branch of the University of Texas. I went to Dallas, rented a ballroom in a hotel uh -huh. and started my own creative writing school. I took a leave of absence. Oh. And there I just had people from the community come into the classes. So they have no experience? Well, basically. they had been writing on their own. Oh, I see. And I think there were a lot of, I, mean, I had about a hundred students start out and it became a part of the University of Texas at Dallas. But those students in those classes published more novels than any at organized universities because the people were truly interested in what they were doing. I mean, so there's, it's estimated there are five million people trying to write a novel right now. Is that right? Yeah, it is so competitive. They say screenwriting's even worse. And screenwriting, I guess we know. Everybody and everyone who lives here, I was going to say everyone in Hollywood, but everyone who lives in Los Angeles is writing a screenplay. Or they yeah, want to. Yeah, that's right. So we have a lot of people. And the interesting thing that I've noticed over the years is you can't tell whose work is going to, going to get published and whose isn't. Uh, you can't tell. It, it's the person who cares the most about it and is willing to put the most work and dedication into it that does the and best. You, can you spot it yeah. f with your students? I can spot talent and the <laughs> ones who, who, my students who have done the best. I had a student last year get a Guggenheim. I mean, he graduated several years ago and he has a, uh, a chair at the University of Mississippi, but uh, he took my class ten times, my graduate <gasps> class ten times. So do you teach it the same way? That's a good, good thing yeah. to think. Do you teach it the same way and so he's missed something the first time, he picks it up the second time? No, it's sort of like if you and I went and had lunch twelve days in a row, we'd I think the lunches would be different. And we'd have something different to say yeah, each time, yeah. so that's what happens when you're teaching? Yeah, well I have a new set of students and 
I'm very interested in the students, and they're very interested in writing, so we work it all out. I see. Yeah. You've also edited 20 books. Yeah. How, where, how do you find time gracious. to do that? 20 books. How, and what's the process? Well, like uh, we edited uh, Christopher Isherwood's Where Joy Resides, a Christopher Isherwood uh, selection. Oh. Came out with Farrar Strauss about seven or eight years ago. Oh. That's, that's an example. And, and how do you do it? If somebody's already written it, uh -huh. and for it to be published, yeah, I mean, basically, Chris had already written. Sure, all the, of his body novel. of work. It, it wasn't a novel. It was a. No, so I chose. No, I chose excerpt. We have two complete novels in in that book, uh -huh. and then we have excerpts from his nonfiction and from you know from his essays and a couple of short stories. So it's it's a selection. And whenever I edit a book, I simply go through tons of material. Uh, choosing what should go in it. I've done a lot of collections of stories and poems. And, oh, I see. And so it's not fun. like editing, say, like bird song. No, this no, is no, your, no. It wouldn't be like no, this. No, it's not like that. I don't really touch anything other than just select what goes in it and write an introduction. What? Oh, I see. Yeah. I see. Because I was going to say, if you were editing something like this, an editor has to know all the facts, except that in a novel, yeah. did the facts count? No, you just hope it's not <laughs> too true and you won't get sued. Oh, that's yeah. <laughs> uh, And talking about Christopher Isherwood, I know another one of your jobs, and I was talking about it at the beginning, that you, you do so many different things, uh, is the executive director of the Christopher Isherwood Foundation. Yeah. Now tell us what that entails and how you can do that from Alabama when Chris was living here. Well, I met Chris when this novel came out, actually. Chris liked it, and, and he wrote me a wonderful letter about it, and I came out, and that's how I met him. And I shortly moved out to Los Angeles, and I basically moved out here because of Chris. He, had the, he, he was the most extraordinary person. I mean, you knew him. He, he's, he, was, he was a wonderful writer, but lots of wonderful artists and actors and writers. You don't want to be around 10 minutes. Their work is wonderful. But their personality isn't so great. Chris, Chris had the personality. He opened his mouth and the truth came out. He was an extraordinary uh, individual. And uh, I loved him very much. So we continued to talk on the phone four or five hours, even after a, a week after I moved to Is Alabama. Right? So we, we, our friendship stayed very close. So I decided, like last year, I thought, of, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could do something for writers and do it in Chris's memory? And so I asked Don Bacardi. And you know, the, the painter. Don and Bacardi lived with Christopher Isherwood in the Santa Monica Canyon, okay. and Don Bacardi made the most beautiful drawings of Isherwood ever. That's right. I mean, and, and, and Don immediately was enthusiastic about establishing the foundation. So then uh, we, we put together a, the board of the foundation is David Hockney, Don Bacardi, and me, and then we have an advisory board. And the uh, advisory board includes one of our, our next guests. Plus, it includes you. Oh, it does. <laughs> yeah. And it includes like uh, the the chancellor of uh, Vanderbilt University, uh, very uh, like um, Doris Roberts, the television star, uh, Jacqueline Bissett, uh, and plus a number of, of novelists and poets. And we have a very exciting advisory board. Those we're, were all support group for the foundation. And and I think most of them loved Chris. I was too. just going to say, yeah. those were the kind of people that you would see at his house when That's you'd right. go over there. So those were um, the, the same people that are well, now well, with and you. And there are brand new people too, like Connie Mae Fowler, who, who has a, she was an Oprah selection with Before Women Had Wings and Remembering oh. Blue. And oh. she's a wonderful a novelist. And uh, she's our latest novelist addition to the advisory board. What all of Christopher's papers, or mm -hmm. most of Christopher's papers, are at the Huntington yeah. Library in uh -huh. San Marino. How, yeah. how does that work? Can anyone go over and read them, look at the papers? I think people can use, if you get permission to the library, you can see the original manuscripts. And I know that when Chris died, Don Bacardi I uh, went to Europe for a while, and, and I, looked, I did a bibliography of all of those manuscripts. Mm -hmm. And I was told by uh, uh, the head of the Humanities Research Center at the University of Texas at Austin that these were the most valuable manuscripts in the world at this time because of what they included. They had, there were only seven letters, I think, from, uh, uh, I'm forgetting his name, 
Eastern short story writer, but Chris had one. There were letters from Misha, Mishima, oh. letters from Auden, well, letters from Spender. Things that had come to him. They yeah. were all his personal belongings, not, yeah. just, no. not just his writings. No, all of these valuable collections, oh. plus his writings, plus the writing. He had uh, drafts of Auden's poems. Oh, it, it's I a see. really rich collection. I and see. the so Huntington was lucky to get it, because a lot of people at libraries, but the Huntington's a great library. Oh, so. it is a great library, yeah. and it's a beautiful facility. where it should be. It's a beautiful yeah. facility. And I didn't realize that everything, I thought it was just straight Christopher Isherwood's writing and... and no, it's and everything that was in his library, plus his books. How did you pick those things? Who picked them? Uh, well, I think, I think Don uh, sold them all to them, so they, they acquired them all. So whatever was there, uh, they took. It yeah. wasn't like they picked this and took no, no, this no, no, and that. No, 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 no. They oh, took I it all. See, I see. It's but a fascinating collection. It's, it's really, I have There could be a letter or two from you in there, too. To see, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> that would be great. Yeah. Oh, I know it would be in there. The photographs that I took of him. I sure. took a lot of snapshots of him. Yeah. Maybe that is true. We'll have yeah. to go check it out. But you wanted to give grants through Christopher's mm -hmm. um, Under his name. name. In his name. How do you choose those people? Uh, well, and are they novelists? Only? Well, the the grants are in the names. The first ones are in the names of dear friends of mine who have died, who were very distinguished writers, such as Thomas Williams, who won a National Book Award, William Gorion, and of course William Gorion was married to Doris Roberts. Oh, so yes. we have the Doris Roberts William Gorion grant. And also, I lived in Dallas previously, and I knew a lot of wealthy people, and so I've basically gone to them for our first funding, and they've oh, been very generous in, in helping support the foundation. The foundation is being supported by a lot of people that didn't even know Chris, but who care a lot about writing. Writing. I mean, there are all these five million people trying to write a novel, I know. and then it's very difficult to get published. Once you get published, it's even harder, because then you get ignored. The easiest thing in the world to do is to be a novelist and, and not be ignored. And then <laughs> even those who build an audience, many of them get forgotten right away. So hopefully, giving grants in their names will help keep them alive as well. We just established a grant in the name of R.V. Castle, and Verlin was my teacher at Brown. Oh. And he had 22 novels. He was the head of creative writing. Well, he taught creative writing at Iowa, Columbia, Brown, and, and oh. Harvard. And a very distinguished man. And, and it's wonderful to have a grant in his name. Oh, so it's all for writers and about writers. And I'm so glad you were here to, to yeah. kind of explain some of this today. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. And thank you all for watching today. And keep writing to 777 South Figueroa, 44th floor, uh, 917. And we'll see you next time on the Joan Quinn Profiles.